Hello, everybody. I'm Mormozine, and I'm doing a really awesome show today. It's about filmmaking. I'm here with Nathan Hill, and uh, he directed a really great movie called Revenge of the Guello, which, um, which, which premiered on Troma last month, and I reviewed. I really enjoyed it. It's a really great movie, and I'm really excited. I got exciting news for everybody. There's a company in L.A. that's wanting to buy my movies, and um, they sent me an email saying they were looking at wanting to purchase my inventory, and I figure if I can sell those, then maybe I can make more and sell them. So I'm really stoked to hear about some filmmaking stuff. And Revenge of the Guello, it's about a man who... Uh, who uh, like, it looks like we got a comment here. Hey, Shane. Oh, Matt, my friend from work says hi. Um, how are you doing, man? Uh, anyways, uh, so he, it's a man, and he's in love with this woman, and they're about to be married. And then the woman mm -hmm. is killed by, like, the mob, by, like, a, a woman mafia. Triads. Triads, okay. And then uh, he he gets he goes hell bent on revenge, and uh, there's lots of action, lots of kung fu, and lot tons and tons of beautiful women. Man, I don't I don't know how you managed to pull that off. That's actually my first question: is how what was your casting process like, and how did you find all those women to be in your movie? Great question, man. You know, and it was great when you picked up on that um, on the last uh, review you did, which was great. I think your review was just just putting it out there was one of my most favorite that I've seen so far on the film. So that was great. Thank you, man. Um, oh yeah, no problem. And uh, I think you, I really think you understood it. I think you got it. You know, there's a lot of people that can't figure out if it's sort of tongue in cheek or whether I'm trying to be serious. They're getting a bit caught in the middle. But I think you understood it. It's it's a fun movie. Do you know what I mean? It's exactly what you said. It's like a throwback to the Van Damme kind of style of martial arts, which was a bit slower with an explanation mark, almost like a, a reinvention of the Bruce Lee movies. Um, yeah. It wasn't supposed to be The Matrix because I don't have the budget for wires. Do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, yeah, so well, I, I enjoyed it on both levels, like, laughing with it and laughing at it and just being oh, impressed cool. by the action and everything. Cause I'm, I'm right. a real stickler for action, man. I, when mm -hmm. I, when I watch a movie, if there's, if it's over edited or shaky cam, there's so many yep. sneaky tricks Hollywood does now to, to cut corners on fight sequences. So when yeah. I see a movie that has good fight choreography, then I'm really impressed. And this movie, you did have great fight choreography. I thought, Thank you, my man. Half of it was me because of my martial arts background and the other half was Essential Defense Academy. So guys that, you know, that do a lot of jujitsu and stuff like that. Um, one of the guys was the Australian silver medalist, um, sumo wrestler. And so he brought a lot of his expertise as well. Um, but getting back to the girls is an interesting question because the casting on this movie was a long process. It actually took me a year, a full year to find all the girls that fit those roles. Um, but obviously that was the fun because, you know, when you've got a script like this and it calls for beautiful Asian talent, you, as a director, you know, you're really in a seventh heaven, you know. Uh, particularly for me, I love uh, the Oriental girls. Um, I kind of favour them in looks. I've always just liked their features. They look yeah, amazing in makeup. You know what I'm saying? Um, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, it took me like a year of talent scouting. And because I'm in Melbourne, Australia, you know, there's there's not a lot of talent. You know, there's a little bit. So you've got to sort of, you know, weed your way through to try and get those characters. And that's probably why it took so long, you know. Oh, yeah, I can imagine. And did you put out, did you put out ads on the Internet or did you put ads? Yeah. Ad yeah, for sure. I mean, I have... um. There's a couple of websites we use here for like open casting balls that are pretty popular, so I use those. Um, I also use Star Now, which I think you've got in LA, but it's probably not very big in LA. It's more, I think it's greater in New Zealand and Australia. Um, and I'll put out an ad. Um, and then also just from my own work, you know, because I work in casting as well. So I was able to kind of access my work database 
So it was kind of an amalgamation of like all these sources and then putting it together and saying, okay, well, who's, who's right for what? And then running the auditions and the rehearsals. Um, but uh, a lot of it I kind of handpicked, you know, you just kind of instinct, you know, oh, this person could work. Then you got to figure out like, can they act? And then if they can, then, you know, you can sort of, and sometimes, you know, train them and get them to that point, as you know, as a filmmaker, just trying to get everyone on that kind of even, even Kindle. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And they all could act. I thought this movie had great acting. And, uh, and also, uh, did, were, were any of the, um, actresses like athletes or gymnasts mm-hmm. or like, mm-hmm. like how did they, with the, with the fight choreography, like, like, did you yeah, have to yep. look for it was that? A bonus. It, yeah, it's a good question. It was kind of a bonus when they had done some martial arts, you know, so like one of the girls was a master then she had, I was like, okay, boom, that's sold. Um, other times I took him into rehearsals and actually taught only the basic moves or the moves for the scene, you know, so like they might have had, say, one girl was like an acrobat, but she hadn't kind of learned punching and kicking, but I, because you had the physique, so it was easy, easy to go, okay, well, you're going to do these moves to just perfect those, you know what I mean? So I didn't try to push people um, too far outside of the comfort zone where all of a sudden, you know, they're doing a whole style. You know, sometimes that wasn't necessary. It was just, okay, here's the scenes. You've got three punches. Let's just work on those. You know, and as you know, women, um, they have a slightly, because their bodies are different, when they do these moves, they always turn out a little bit different on screen than the men. And uh, there's nothing worse than, you know, sort of bad choreographed women fighting. You know, it makes me, I just kind of cringe. So it was important to get that brutality because, as you know, there was a lot of blood. Um, so it was almost like, you know, these model Asian talent that could act that then some could fight or I'd have to teach how to fight. And that was an awesome process, man. I'd do it again. Right on. And then there was also some pretty big explosions in the movie. Like I remember in particular one really good explosion. And like like how how difficult was that to film? Yeah, that was uh, – that one you're talking about was CGI. Um, so uh, – basically utilizing a guy I've, I've had on previous films is really good with that, really good with digital compositing. Uh, but it, the trick is the shot, you know, because if you're going to do those CGI effects, you've got to, A, it's got to be on, it's got to be a tripod shot, you know, it's got to be lit right. So all of, already I'm thinking wide shot, daytime, and then you're looking at the frame and what's happening in the middle of it. So um, if you look really, really closely in that shot, there is a little bit of flare as I move, you know, right on the edges. Um, cause you're keying it. So yeah, it's really tricky. Um, but yeah, once you've sort of done it a few times, you, you just, you get better at it. It's just a practice thing. That shot you can see now in the background is what we're talking about playing live now. But, um, yeah, it was, uh, it worked out okay, you know, so it was good to have that, like almost a money shot for the trailer. You know, you always need a few of those. Here, my, my good friend John Migley has a question. He says, how long did it take to choreograph and rehearse the fight scenes? Mm, there's so many fight scenes, so um, you'd have to pick one. But, like, for example, the, the sumo wrestling uh, uh, scene that I fought in the main bout at the end, that was pretty extensive. You know, that would have been uh, probably a couple of weeks of, uh, of rehearsals um, so that, you know, when we shot it, you could just kind of go in there and, and, and kind of execute. Cause I like to rehearse and plan everything. So when I go on set, it's just execution. I don't want to ask questions too much on set. Um, cause you know what it's like. You're running under pressure. There's time problems. There's weather. There's just so many logistics. So, um, yeah, we pre planned, but probably about two weeks, uh, rehearsals, uh, for, for any given fight scene. Yeah. At least. Um, how did, how, how, how did you get, how did you do all the paperwork, like the release forms and all that? Did you have help with that or? Well, cause I'm a film school grad. So, you know, I'm pretty savvy with the, um, production side. So, and I've got my own company. So, um, when you're doing a release form, you know, as long as it's your company, um, and you've got the, that release from the artist, then, uh, legally you know, that that's binding. So that, that's a, that's an easy part. So, so for some for somebody who's not been to film school would we sure. think it'd be a good idea to partner with somebody who has been to film school to make sure that you do all the legal stuff and correctly and it's a good question man 
you know, when you're in film school, you know, it's hard because you're going in with such expectation and you might even have an health, a healthy ego <laughs> and you do the best you can. But then when you graduate, you realize there's all these things they either didn't know or didn't have time to teach. And it's kind of like, you know, we've taken you this far. Now you've got to go and learn it on your own. And, you know, filmmakers, we're also self-indulgent, and very protective. We're not that giving sometimes. And, we're, and it's taken us so long to learn how to do it. A lot of people don't want to give you the, the answers. You know, it's almost a secret. It's like, you know, that's my gold and I'm not going to share it with you. You know, there's that right. competitiveness. Um, but I myself have always seeked out, you know, a mentor or someone greater than me, and, and that's a lot of people, you know, um, that uh, are ahead of me that I can sort of talk to. For example, I, don't, I might not have mentioned it, but I talked a little bit to Paul Heller, who um, was one of the producers on Enter the Dragon, you know, and I actually spoke to him. Yeah, bro. So I spoke to him a bit online before I even shot the film, you know, and uh, William Catt, who plays the greatest American hero, um, you know, from the TV show, he's also a friend. So sometimes I would call on him and say, hey, what do you think of this or that? And, you know, so, um, you know, it's very humble, you know, you know to um, it's humbling to, uh, you know, be great at what you do, but always, always uh, respect your elders, you know, and that and that's kind of what I do. That's great. Yeah, I know filmmaking is definitely like a team sport. It takes it takes multiple people. And so that's I really good to know that you can that I could reach out to people and and, yeah. and ask questions and stuff as far as like getting all the paperwork done. Um, is there what what's coming up next for you? Your next movie? Yeah. So I'm, I'm actually it's it's cool because um, I, I like to change genre. You know, I'm one of those guys who's never wanted to be boxed. You know, so I've already got like a gothic horror film and I've got a sci-fi movie and now I've got my martial arts film. And, uh, you know, the next one I'm doing is uh, is kind of a drama mystery sleuth um, called Colorblind, which I'm in post-production now. And that's got Jane Badler in it. Do you remember V, the series, Visitors? Do you remember Jane? Oh, yeah. she, played, she was the alien. Yeah. She ate like the guinea pig. Do you remember that? So, yeah. Um, <laughs> So she's she's uh, one of the leads in my new film because she's she's got a house. She also lives in Australia as well as LA. So um, we 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 connected. Yeah. So I'm I'm cutting that now. But in this film, it's the it's the flip of Guaylo because in Guaylo I played the hero, but in Colorblind I'm playing kind of like the uh, the down and out, uh, you know, sort of the down and out in Beverly Hills Nick Nolte character. I'm like complete opposite, you know, and I, in fact I get beat up. You know, so I'm try. I love the duality of, of uh, performance. You know, what I want, don't just want to be the hero. I just want to play. You know, the kind of down and out guy. So that's that's what this is. Wow, it sounds great. I'm really stoked to see it. And this question: when 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 you when Troma picked up your movie for Troma now, did they do it directly from you or through a different company? Because I've noticed that a lot of movies on Troma now have like a, a logo before them of a different film company? Mm. So, yeah, good question. Um, so Troma would have gone through my sales agent in America and that sales agent I was able to get uh, through the festival circuit. Like, so, for example, I had a movie before Guaylo called Model Behavior, which is like an action thriller. It's kind of a uh, uh, my version or my take on basic instinct. You know, it's the cop that falls in love with the, su with the chief suspect who happens to be a beautiful girl. <laughs> oh, nice. Huh. Uh, you'd actually like that. So um, I entered that one into California Film Awards and I won. I won Best Film. This was like back in 2014, I think, or 2015. Um, so through that, I got a sales agent and the sales agent was able to take it and shop it around to those companies. So they take a cut, you know, they take a percentage like a royalty. Um, but, uh, but it works because, you know, I personally, you know, I'm so uh, engrossed in what I'm doing. I don't have time to do that stuff. And that's why those guys are there, you know. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, so this is kind of off topic, but. I'm sure you're aware of the, the gun issue in America, all of the gun violence. Is, yeah. is right now a good time for a Death Wish remake, do you think? <laughs> it's funny you should ask because um, uh, a local distributor here, do you know Monster Pictures? I've heard of them. They, 
They actually did, you know, the Greasy Strangler? Yeah, I'm a big fan yeah. of that movie. Yeah, me too, bro. So I, I helped out on one of the special features on disc two of that um, and uh, with, with some casting and stuff because uh, Monster Pictures is the, is our local distributor for that film. And um, they, um, uh, they, they're they also getting behind the new Death Wish. I was just seeing online just earlier that um, they're promoting it. Um, and they're also interested in Guaylo is why I was, why I was getting to that. Um, oh, which yeah. would be the Australian region. Um, but yeah, it's funny, man, because you know, over here, I guess, um, we've got an opinion, but I've always felt like with Australia, they're a little bit behind, you know, they're kind of like geographically, they're like, you know, at the bottom of the planet, you know what I mean? And we, we get everything last. Like we're, we're, we're taking from America. We're taking from England. We're taking from Asia, you know, but we're always that little bit behind. So. We're, we're probably a little bit wary to make too much of an opinion because that's like your country. We don't want to offend anybody. Um, um, so, right. yeah, just out of respect. Um, I, uh, I guess the only thing is I was, I was listening to the radio the other morning in, in the car and I was listening. I think it was John F. Kennedy's nephew who's in parliament and he was talking. He was talking about, and actually on air, they said, you know, why don't you run for president? Because this guy just spoke so amazingly. And the thing that got to me was him talking about the fact that a lot of kids, a lot of primary school kids are killed in schools, you know, across America uh, because of guns. Um, and that really shocked me because that's not something that we kind of get in the news. We only, we only really get, you know, the big event when there's like a mass shooting. But these other things that are going on where kids are still being killed, um, there's a lot of stuff that we don't, we don't hear about. So when I heard him speaking, I was kind of, I was a bit upset about that. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, you, you, yeah, you've, you've made a horror movie, haven't you? Yeah, Tomboys. Tomboys. Where where is that available this to watch? It's actually getting a re-release next month through SRS and Ron, and our good friend Ron Bonk, who's just just done Shark House. Nice. So it's gonna be released on DVD? Yeah, yeah. Cool. I'll have to keep an eye out for that and, and order that. Maybe I could pre order it even. Yeah, we should maybe do a chat on that because you'd love it. It's um, it's real kind of trauma, Fangoria kind of ballpark. You know, it's about a uh, five country girls kidnap a serial rapist to to torture and murder him to get revenge. Oh wow, it's really sick. It's really sick. Yeah, yeah, it sounds right up my alley, man. Well, <laughs> hey, I want to, I want to thank you so much for chatting with me and. Would you would you like a copy of the audio of this? Oh Before man, we... either way. Um, and is it, has anyone else got any other questions while we're here, or did you want to ask me anything else? I've got a little bit more time if you like. Oh okay. Um, how, how do you how, how 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 could you give me some tips on screenwriting, maybe? <laughs> I tell you what, man, the best screenwriting book I've ever read was the one by Sid Field, Sid Field's screenwriting, because, you know, his novel, I think he was the guy that was responsible for Chinatown. You know, Chinatown, I think, won Academy Award for Best Screenplay, um, and and that's really the best book you can get because it's like a course. So um, as you're reading it, he's kind of, kind of telling you to do exercises, and if you follow it, you will, without a doubt, you'll have, you know, an amazing screenplay. I tested out the theory and I sent one of the scripts I'd written into Shriekfest and I got into quarterfinals and another one I came second. So it, it goes to show that, you know, it does work. Right on. I, uh, I'm, I'm planning on, on using some public domain titles to do, cool. to base some of my scripting off of. And I also own the rights to some stories and stuff that that I can um, adapt to the to the screen. And, Absolutely. Uh, I'm really. I'm just. So, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, no, you go, brother. You go. I'm just so excited right now about this offer to buy my movies. It, it would oh, be. Oh, that's huge. It would be such a weight off, like like a, a weight off my chest, and, and yeah. I a, a fresh start where I can make new better movies and know that that i might be able to sell them as well and yeah, like absolutely yeah it's the company is an advertising company the 
they they run ads on um connected TVs like Roku and Fire Stick and all oh, that. Yeah. So yeah, I man. know that they must think they must think they can make money with my show. And the only That's way true. they make money with my movies is if people watch them. Then so the more people who watch them, the better off I am, and I'm building an audience and everything. So I'm supposed to talk yeah. to them on the phone. I, I'm I'm just really excited about it, man. And 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 the That's idea fantastic. of getting to create new, better movies and stuff, and and mm. uh, and even like hire people and. Um, and Bro, pay. I was going to ask you too. What is what's uh, what's one of your favorite horror films? Probably my all-time favorite is Dawn of the Dead '78. Yeah, yep. I watched it with my father on VHS, and it had a <laughs> huge impact on me. It was probably like my favorite bonding moment with my father. So awesome, awesome. Mine's Lost Boys. Yeah, that's another great one too. Have you seen I'm Lost Boys? Can you see the calf here? Maggots. Oh, yeah. eating maggots. Michael. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That's my favorite part, too. Yeah, it's a brilliant scene. I grew up not too far from there. I grew up in a town called Escondido, which was a suburb of San Diego. Oh, wow. And so, and so L.A. was just a jump away. Yeah, because Santa Carla is like, um, or Santa Cruz, I should say, is over the over the hill, isn't it? It's on the other side of the mountain. Is that right? Oh yeah, I guess so. And I, I think I had an uncle who lived close to there, but uh, cool. yeah. And then a friend of mine was doing a, um, did the video for, or not, not a friend, but a, an artist I admire did a video for um Corey Feldman for his band wow. Corey Feldman's wow. Angels the truth and he made like a documentary about it I tried to invest some money in it and uh I'm really looking forward to that that's awesome and also I should tell you as well man our other mutual friend um Bianca Elaine Bianca you know Bianca Elaine the zombie zombie girl Bianca do you remember her yeah, Zombinitrix. Yeah, yeah. She's got one scene in my new movie, Colorblind. Oh, wow. Yeah, because she's great. Always liked her, man. She's stunning, a stunning girl. My my good friend Israel says The Hills Have Eyes, 1975, is his favorite horror movie. Oh, that's a great film, brother. That's a fan. That's um, it's Wes Craven, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. I just watched it recently and did a review for my YouTube channel, and nice. that's a, that's a great movie. Also, you mentioned Corey Feldman because we've also got a mutual friend with Tiffany Tiffany Shippe, who was um uh, she was engaged to to Haim before he died. Do, do you wow. remember that? No, yeah. I didn't. I didn't know that. Yeah, because they were actually because you know the two Corys they came back and they did that reality show. And Tiffany and Corey were Haim, which were actually in the process of getting their own one up, and then he passed. I don't know if you knew that. Oh gosh, Israel says Papa Jew. That's the uh, <laughs> uh, what's it, well, what what's his real name? But they shorten it to Papa Jew. Um, I don't know. I'd have to look it up. I can't remember. <laughs> oh yeah. Gosh. That's but, thing. yeah, it's it's a good movie. It's a great – I love the actor in that um, who's, uh, you know, on the cover. What's his name? Um, he was in, like, Weird Science, and, you know, he pops up in all the 80s films. He's a really scary horror film, actually, not that long ago. Um, you know, the bald guy, kind of funny-looking guy, weird ears. Oh, God, what's his name? Yeah, definitely. I um, can't believe his name, but he does conventions all the time, I know. Yeah, that's right. Do you know, um, do you know Scott Guider? Do you know Scott Geiter? He does like podcast. No, I don't. Okay, he's he's a mate of mine. He's friends with him, I think. But uh, great, great, great character actor. Right on. Well, man, I appreciate you being on my show. This is my second episode on Facebook Live. My last episode has sixty-one views right now. So 
it's doing better than what I would do on YouTube. And I feel, I felt it would, especially when I get into where I can share it to groups and, and um, do some distributing it before I go live. Then I think I'll get even more visitors and more comments and everything. Well, you got to think too. I mean, it's a long episode. So if you had 61 views for a, a half an hour, one hour show, that that's pretty good, you know, because a lot of people there, they just switch off too quick. They might have watched half of it and then, and then flicked off and you don't get the view. But a lot of people are watching, you know, most people will watch the first 10 minutes anyway. You know what I mean? To get the gist. Oh, yeah, definitely. And the, and people will, um, and, Okay, so Israel Israel Ray says, I'm creating a film about Doug Henning, and I found out most around the world don't know he died, so I decided not to include it in the film and ruin the magic. What would you have done? And Papa Jupiter was his name from Hills Have Eyes. So what's the question again, sorry? He's making a movie about a magician, and, and most of the world doesn't realize that he died already. So he's decided not to add that to the movie so that it doesn't like ruin the magic. What would you do in that situation? I mean, if it's like a, if it's like part of the story and it's a plot point, you know, you don't reveal it, you build up to it. But if it's kind of wanting to create a buzz, say for example, um, look at Queen of the Damned, which actually, which actually worked on, uh, you know, Aaliyah had passed and because she'd passed, that was a great vehicle for the studios to get people to see it. Do you know what I mean? So it's really a double edged sword, you know? Oh yeah, definitely. And I'm, I'm not, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what I would do about that. Um, me, yeah, I think you're right. Israel just, uh, just leave it out and then let. Yeah, if it's part of the storytelling device, leave it out and just let let people discover it on their own. Maybe you know, um, if it's low budget, if it's indie, I mean, if it's not a studio movie, then um, do what do whatever you want to do. You know, because if it's a studio movie, obviously they're going to use whatever they can to manipulate uh, the buyers. You know, b beforehand. You know, like the whole thing with the crow, for example. You know, when Brandon Lee died. I reckon they got double the amount of people buying tickets just because they wanted to see this person or this actor who's who was no longer with us, you know, that had made this movie, you know, like they probably got double the audience because he had passed, you know. So it's 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 funny what the studios do to manipulate um, the outcome, you know, the the end dollar, um, the margin. Uh, so I think when you when it's if it's not studio and it's your own film, you do what you want. You know, you got to stay true to yourself. You know, do what you think is best. That's my answer. Is that cool? <laughs> yeah, definitely, and and I agree. Uh, yeah, Thanks, I was just I was just thinking that earlier is that you got to be an artist at all times. You know what I mean, and do what's right for you and what makes sense to you. I remember, um, people for a while, everybody was saying three to five minute videos is is what you're supposed to be making but I wanted to go longer with the aims of being a feature filmmaker. So I was trying to make my videos as long as I could. And now mm. I'm glad I am because I'm at a point where I'm getting ready to hopefully sell those long form videos and that mm. they, that that's why they're valuable is because they're long enough to carry advertising and everything. So, and, you know, eventually as well, like, it's, you know, you're building up a, a body of work just with these interviews. I've got a friend who's doing a similar thing with the podcasts and he wanted to go longer. And now his pods, they're like an hour or even an hour and a half. But when you look at his catalog now, it's extensive. And I said, you know, one day you're going to be able to package all that. It's going to be worth something for you. You know what I mean? Um, so it's, it's, it's again, doing what you want to do, but I love some of your reviews, bro. I think I actually do think you're on the money. Like I've watched a few different reviews you've done that are even movies I wouldn't watch. And I think you're pretty spot on with like changing genre. Like you seem to be, you know, you know, you're not just in a horror realm, even though you're doing, you're doing stuff with trauma. I think you know about cinema in general, uh, which is really cool. Um, and I was going to ask you as well um, how your how you got into trauma. What was your affiliation to to be the reviewer for Trauma TV? How did that happen? 
Um, well, I, I've requested to be on Troma Now TV, but I haven't heard back yet. I do it just more as a fan. Um, but I, I first saw them on this channel called USA and mm-hmm. USA had a program called Up All Night. Oh, uh, yeah. And, uh, and I really enjoyed the movies. And then one year I was at Comic Con. I was about 14 and I was wearing a Last House on the Left t shirt. And, uh, somebody said, nice t shirt. And I looked up and it was Lloyd Kaufman and he was wearing, <laughs> He was wearing the Surf Nazis Must Die t-shirt. And I said, yeah, I, you're, that. I said, your t-shirt's cool too, man. And, <laughs> and so I saw him over the years at the San Diego Comic Con and just kind of, uh, got to know him. Oh man, I'm getting compliments in the chat room. Shane is a visionary and innovator. Thanks so yeah, much, man. Him. That's awesome. Yeah. I just I try. Think- and- yeah. I try and do my own unique thing and people try and point out my flaws and things I need to work on, but I just try and be myself and continue to work and, and be active and create content and everything. So. Oh, power to you, man. That's excellent. You know, and, and thanks for um uh, doing the review on Guaylo too. That's excellent. It's fun for me because, you know, you're in the States and I guess even though I'm in Australia, you know, a lot of the movies, um, that I, uh, <laughs> just looking at the comment, that's funny. Um, <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> but the movies that I grew up with are, are the movies that you, you know, that you're kind of in amongst, you know what I mean? So, um, I, I'm also, I guess, a creative, but I'm, I'm a fan too, you know, and I love the States and I grew up watching American films. I'm not, I would never deny that. Um, and, uh, and it's made my life better. You know, it's, uh, at the end of the day, it's entertainment. You know what I mean? And what, uh, what, what is better than that anyway? You know? Yeah, definitely. It's entertainment and it's a side hustle. I like to work and then have my own side hustle and stay busy yeah. doing my own thing. And just now I've been building, um, digital assets i just had a viral video it got 1.5 views on facebook it was uh it was just me eating beans on facebook live oh yeah i think i might have said that yeah and then my buddy who's a producer did a dance mix version of it and (laughs) uh yeah I know that this guy's talking about butthole surfers. I know, I know who he's talking about. <laughs> yeah, me too. I'm, 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 I'm a fan of butthole surfers. They had that album where the pencil was sticking in the ear, and they had like that's one of their later albums. And um, I've heard a few of their stuff. They're, um, they're definitely punk. Pretty cool. Great band. Have you, have you talked to um, uh, Tony Newton from the UK? Do you know Tony? Because he does all like the grind exploitation DVDs for trauma. Do you know oh, him? Oh wow, that's a good tip. I've talked to him on Twitter a couple times, but I'll he's have really to cool. Have him get on. He's like you, bro, but he's been doing a few video chats as well. Um, and he he dresses up and he's got a, a sidekick. Um, and he's he's been doing some cool reviews. He reminded me a bit of you, but he's like the UK version, you know. And um, Tony's amazing, and so is obviously Ron Bonk. He's amazing, and uh, you know those guys have reached out to me, and I've sort of given back. And you know, three is three of us have been chatting. But Tony, it'd be amazing to see you and him talk together. Yeah, because cool. I am a big fan of those grind exploitation movies, and I think there's a new one coming out too, pretty soon. There is. I didn't tell you, but I've got a short in the next one, in the in the fourth one. Oh, great. Awesome. Yeah. I'm looking Which forward to that. You'll like it too. It's a vampire one. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, that's that that, that would be one of my goals is to get a get a short in there, make a trailer yeah. and Yeah, very easy. I, I actually have a, a app on my phone that does retro filters. So I can do yeah. eight. I can do eight millimeter and VHS. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. So I could make it look like it was shot on VHS. That would probably fit fit well with that. Oh, that's perfect. I think it only has to be 1080, 1080p is all is the submission guideline. Um, and he he's just done another one, uh, clown exploitation. So he's got 
clown exploitation. He's also got the grind exploitation four, and he's also working on another one I think called Shock. Uh, what is it? Shock. I'm trying to think what it is now. Um, I've got it here. I'm just having a look. Um, is the clown is the I think clown it's trash, Trasharama. Sorry, sorry to cut you off. It's now Trasharama, which is a compilation of trailers. That is the clown exploitation one. Is that one finished already? That I think submissions are still open. I actually just sent one in, um, but I think he's still uh, he's still going. I think it's Body Bag Films. If you go to that website, you'll find all the all the stuff there. The submission guidelines. Yeah, I'll have to submit something for sure. Cool. Right on, man. Well, um, thanks so much for being on. I'm a big fan. Looking forward Thank to your you. next movie. I'm going to order your horror movie from SRS. Thank and you, bro. What's it called again? That one's the Tomboys. Tomboys. Okay, cool. Yeah, you'll like that. And then everybody, thanks for watching. Please thumbs up. And uh, and if there's a way for you to subscribe to my live broadcast, then please do that. And have a wonderful night. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Shane.